Welcome back. If you're new here, my name is Erin. I'm a clinical and perinatal psychologist. I'm a mum and I'm the author of two books. I thought I would talk a bit more about books because I've been feeling the need to. So it is really hot here today. It is in the middle of the Australian summer. And so I might be having this little smoothie as I go. It's so pretty. It's very, I don't know. This is very summery. I know you can't see this if you're on the podcast listening. But it's a mango macadamia smoothie. It comes from, actually, I'll link that. There's a book by another mum too. It's from The Global Vegan by Ellie Bullen. It's one of my favourite books for like go-to snacks, drinks in the morning. In summer, I like to try and like make myself something nice for breakfast when I've got a bit of time. So side note there, you're probably not supposed to eat and drink when you're doing a podcast, but... I'm a rebel. And if you follow Gretchen Rubin's four tendencies, four personality tendencies, that's what you need to know about me. I'm a rebel. So these are not necessarily parenting books per se. They're books that I have found helpful in this particular phase of mothering. So I don't want this to be too long. I'm just going to get into it. This first one, I love this one, Ikigai. It is the Japanese secret to a long and happy life. It really helps with that concept and I talk about this in my books as well when you sort of are a bit like lost who am I what do I want what are my passions how's life changed after having children so this is not in particularly anything to do with mothering or parenting specifically but a the cover is really really pretty and I just like to look at it but also I pick it I find myself picking it up and putting it down a lot because it kind of helps you figure out like what's your why what's your like what are you meant to do here and so I think on those days where mothering can feel like a little bit of a fog sometimes and you're like whether it's like your identity like that's all you ever wanted to do is be a mother and that fulfills you and your identity amazing doesn't for me I don't know it doesn't for a lot of people I mean something else So it gives you something useful to come back to in terms of like, who am I outside of this? So I would recommend that one. My next one is by an Australian author. It's called Badass Mums. It's 30 boundary-breaking women getting beat done. Uh, This is another kind of pick-up, put-down book. It's got peaches in it. (laughs) Other than the ones my children have drawn in there. Yeah, true mum life. But it has all these different women in history, some who are living, some who are no longer with us, who do stuff outside of being a mum. And I come back to this again and again and again. It is good for having around for that thing that sometimes we're all guilty of where you could probably name like 10 famous men really, really easily, but could you name 10 famous mums throughout history who have done stuff outside of this for my next book about parental burnout an idea I'm trying on is going back to this idea of how did women in the past go through difficult things how did they navigate that because it's something I'm interested in but this is a good book for having around for teaching your children like oh who is Aretha Franklin what did she go through you know like what was her life like it's really good um I mean I've got two daughters it doesn't really matter whether you've got daughters or sons or kids who identify as neither it's just handy to have around these are in no particular order but this one so any of my mb alex books so my um, she she's on youtube she has a podcast she does all things i don't know how she does it but she does she's a neuroscientist she um she was blossom back in the 90s if you were old enough to watch that show and then she was on the big bang theory but she's also a neuroscientist and she talks a lot about attachment parenting Probably, I suppose, if like everything's on a continuum, right? Tiny little bit on the crunchy end for me. I identify as a bit crunchy. That's fun. This is probably getting a little bit more crunchy for my liking. But in terms of that really good, strong um, neurological component about secure attachment and what is secure attachment from like looking at other mammals, looking at our brains, looking at the way our communities do things, anthropology, all that kind of stuff. So this one is called... Beyond the Sling. It's it's a bit older now, but it's still really useful. Real Life Guide for Raising Confident, Loving Children, The Attachment Parenting Way. So if you're looking for an attachment parenting book, mine is where I would start. There are plenty of attachment parenting books written by plenty of people, but this is the one I kept coming back to. 
um, any of her books are good. Next one. This is by my friend Sarah. Sarah and I went to uni together. It's called Keep Sane and Parent On. And so it's a guide for like all the things really. Uh, feeling overwhelmed by parenting, surprised by your reactions to your children, struggling to in find joy in the experience of parenthood, doubts about good enough parenting, all that kind of stuff that we've struggled with. Sarah put this into a nice book for us. So that is Sarah Purvey's Keep Sane and Parent On. Also not exactly a parenting book, but something I think, if it's not this book, choose one that's similar. So this is called It Didn't Start With You, How Inherited Family Trauma Shapes Who We Are and How to End the Cycle. Any book on inner child stuff, intergenerational trauma, that kind of thing, I really think every parent needs to get their hands on that kind of book because as you may or may not have discovered already, one of the biggest parts about parenting is how much it triggers your own childhood wounding, even if you don't realise it's triggering your childhood wounding. I talk about this in most of my work, like when we get overstimulated, when we have massive reactions to things, it's often to do with this oh, push-pull, right? So one example of you don't want your children to go through what you went through at mealtime. For example, you must eat everything on your plate, like stop whining, there's starving children in Africa, all of that stuff. But then when they refuse to eat what you've presented for them, they throw it up against the wall, they change their mind, they liked something yesterday, now they don't like it today. There is an inner five-year-old, maybe in all of us, there is definitely me who's like, how dare this brat get away with this, right? That's a childhood wounding thing. So it's the push-pull of... You want your children to be raised in some of the ways that are more kind, informative, as we know better, we do better kind of thing than you were. But then the inner child in you has this like sense of injustice that it's like not fair, right? So work on your childhood wounds. This is a good place to start. This one I love too. This is by Sarah Buckley. She's a GP here in Australia. Gentle birth gentle mothering so um this is more kind of like I guess if you're it doesn't have to be if you're pregnant but it can be straight after it's so useful one of the things that Sarah talks about in particular that I think is really useful for people is understanding the hormones of birth and understanding the hormones of the postpartum period because it all affects like your hormones your nervous system your brain everything's interconnected um again more stuff about attachment parenting Gentle parenting, yeah, that's a good one. Now, this is one um, I also should have mentioned, I don't have paperbacks for all of these, so I'll hold them up if I have them, but some of them I've either lent to people or I've listened to the audio book or an e-book, so I consume books across all mediums. But this is one I think you probably want in paperback, which is not, this is an art book, right? It's not a parenting book. Seeing ourselves, women's portraits. This is Another really important book, I think, potentially to have in your house. I'm just going to read this little bit here from the um, someone who said something nice about it. <laughs> you put on cover. It invites us to consider women's self portraiture as a genre in its own right, invaluable. So I talk about this in social media detox for months this concept of women in art. Like, art is such a way of looking at how do we see ourselves in history from the concept of like, taking a selfie, that being narcissistic. We need to, I suppose, be aware of ourselves as mothers, but also for our children to know that women didn't exist in art for a long, long time. Is that because there were no good female artists? Is it because there were no good portrait takers? No, we were left out of a huge chunk of history. So this book puts together all sorts of women's self-portraits from all different periods in time that's in earlier ones and then we get up to the more modern ones and I think this is something like even if you don't read read at all like you could flip through even with the children and look at the pictures and have discussions about oh I mean depends on the age of your child right but some of these are like okay so talk to me about this what was this representing why like why are there so few women's self-portraits in history um and I just think it's a really nice kind of commentary piece about motherhood and history in general 
I'm not doing very well with this smoothie, am I? I'm talking too much. Hang on. I will flush up a picture of the covers here. Um, these are the ones I wrote down that I don't have on me in terms of like an actual paperback. One I think you can't do without is the postnatal depletion cure by Oscar Saralak, is it? Is that how you say your name, Oscar? I'm not sure. Um, refer to this time and time and time again. Again, Oscar is another, is he a GP? Is he, yeah, he's a medical doctor in Australia. He, he just has a beautiful holistic approach to everything. So, again, thinking about postnatal as, like, looking hormonally, looking at physically what's happening in your body. Again, what's happening in your brain, so much stuff. It was a sentence, I think, in his book about the idea that mums in particular should really be using social media less. I took that sentence and thought, let's expand. Um, and so that's what I ended up writing a book about, social media detox for mums. But uh, there was a lot of what was in Oscar's book that I thought, mm, I want to take what he's written about the postnatal period and everything that's going on for us psychologically, emotionally, spiritually, physically, and translate that into what's happening to us when we consume social media. So that's what that book was about. Any kind of, like, you don't have to follow any particular approach. I wouldn't say, like, I fit into a neat box of, like, oh, I'm a Montessori mum or I'm a Waldorf mum or I'm a, you know, Steiner mum or whatever. But the concept of, I think it's called the Montessori toddler, I'll pop up the picture, but, and I'll link it in the show notes, the idea of how to organise your, like, a space for children. Like, if you're fortunate enough to have a space that you can have, like, a playroom, great, but also, like, it could just be a shelf. Like, so what, how do you organise stuff for children in a way that, I talked about this in a different video, you create a yes space for your children. So you create a space that's not full of noisy toys that have one function that you, like, push a button and they do something and that's it. Your child's lost interest and moved on to something else. But things that create a sense of confidence, inquisitiveness, learning kind of just life skills and going back to the essentials of play and hands-on like kind of stuff developing a craft that doesn't have to mean arts and crafts but like developing you know fine motor skills hand-eye coordination imagination open-ended play all of that a useful place to start when you're kind of like how do I want to set up a space in my home um, for my children that can be that yes space that Magda Gerber talks about where you can put your child in a room and it's not just no don't touch that don't touch that that's unsafe don't do that like calm peaceful space that's been an important thing for me as a mum I will round up by doing a plug for my own books because I'm an author <laughs> these are the books I've written as part of my motherhood journey this one more than a healthy baby finding strength and growth after birth trauma I wrote this one after having two traumatic births myself it's about how to cope so all from the like what is birth trauma how do you explain it to people how do you understand it what counts as birth trauma plus a whole heap about post-traumatic growth and strategies for how to cope that are things you can teach your children that are not necessarily trauma-specific, they're not necessarily birth-specific, they're not necessarily mother-specific. This is just a whole heap of handy tools that I found useful and wish I had had in book form, I suppose, after um, the births of my daughters. It's designed to be, like, picked up and put down. The amount of times I have seen someone out and about and they've been like, oh, I haven't quite finished your book yet, like, like there's going to be a test or something, <laughs> like, oh, there's a certain time to read it. This is, like, a potentially, like, over a few years. And I've also had plenty of people say, yeah, I want to read it, but it's not quite the right time. So it's a pick up, put down, you will learn something in here. And that's the way I write all my books is to be like, would you get something out of it if you didn't get through the whole thing? Yes, because I'm hyper aware of it. Mums ain't got time to read books necessarily. So the other one, my my second one, it's upside down as well now. Here we go. Uh, social media detox for mums, a new way to find balance. So this began with, I suppose, what was going to be an eight-week detox. I started in 2001. I started on International Women's Day. And I took it through to Mother's Day with the idea that I would just experiment and see what happened. I honestly didn't think it would make that much difference to my mental health or my life or my business. But like anything, the scientist in me said, well, you've got to test it. And I was pretty shocked actually to realise how 
stressed and overwhelmed and overstimulated I was. And so it sort of started as like an eight week detox, wrote some blogs about it and then found I had so, so, so much to say. So it is a couple of things. One is it's a reflection piece on this idea of have we settled for numbing instead of actual relaxation and actual fun as mothers? How do we cope with burnout? How do we cope with overstimulation? How do we cope with all the childhood wounding that comes up with parenting and that kind of thing? But it is also, if that's all you wanted from it, a five-step plan for how to detox from social media or quit from social media in a way that's kind, it's non-judgy, but it's also very, very practical. You're going to come away with some useful tools for whatever you want to do. I'm not, um, I said at the start, I'm a rebel personality type. I'm not in the business of telling other people what to do. I think um, if someone had said to me, like, oh, you must quit social media or you're going to be a terrible mother or you must quit social media or your mental health's going to suffer, I'd just be like, no, <laughs> I'm not doing that. So it's more like a, <clears throat> it's not a, a mantra for here's something you have to do. I did it, look at me, how wonderful I am. I do think social media, quitting it, absolutely changed my life. And I don't, still don't think at this stage, I would go back. It's nearly two years since I've done that and I don't think I would go back. However, some people say, oh, I need it for my business. I'm like, that's fine, but test it out. So this will give you tools to test it out. Um, it's doing what you want to do, but making sure you're making an informed decision as you do it. And if you're making statements like, oh, my friends won't talk to me or oh, I need it for my business or whatever, test it. Actually get the evidence. So this will give you the practical tools to actually do the evidence testing that you need to make your own decisions. Make your own decision. I don't care what you do. I just want to like dangle the carrots as we can say. This was helpful. Here's some strategies um, that would be useful for you even if you never quit social media. 